And I'd invite you to give ear to the reading of God's Word. It's found in Acts chapter 2. We're reading verses 1 through 18. And, and this really is the story of uh, the birth of the church by the movement of God's Holy Spirit. And I, I'd encourage you, as I read, to, to try to get a, a mental image of the, how this went down. Uh, like we said last week, these are, these are real stories about real people. These things really happen. And so, uh, if you will, uh, try, to, try to see in your mind's eye uh, these things actually taking place. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or, or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas around, of, of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages, about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there, amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are saying. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that, right? I think Actually, I think that was kind of a joke from Peter, right? Yeah. No. What you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people, your sons and daughters, will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those last days, I will pour out my Spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I'd like to ask you if you would, please pray with me. Oh God, we, we really don't have the right words in fact, I don't think they exist in our vocabulary to express our gratitude rightly to you, specifically for your word. That you would reveal yourself to us, that you would reveal the way of salvation. And that even as we read, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would, you would speak life into our hearts, our souls, our spirits, our minds. And so, God, with the confidence of your children, that's what we're asking for today. That you would speak to us. Speak life into us. And God, give us the faith that it takes, the courage that is demanded to not just be hearers of your word, but followers as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing today this series that we started last week called I Love the Church from the Book of Acts. And what we're doing is we're looking at the story of the early church that we find there in Acts to see the beauty and the power um, of the church of Jesus Christ. And the whole purpose of this is that as we look at, at the beauty, the strength, the power of the early church, as we see the devotion of those early believers, as we see how God gives them a love between them, brings them together into a family in Jesus, as we see how God is going to use them and use them so powerfully in His work to reconcile God and humankind that our hearts would long 
to be a part of that same amazing, powerful movement to the extent that we would fervently, persistently pray for, let's call it a, a new Pentecost, right? A work of revival where God pours out His Spirit on us that we might have that same sort of level of strength of devotion to Jesus, that He would bind us one to another in the love of Christ, and that He would use us to reconcile the people of our community who are far from God to God in Jesus Christ. That's really the, the purpose of this whole series. And, and this morning we're going to zero in on the fact, and this is a fact, the fact that, that if the church is actually going to be alive, that we will, we will, the church has to, must live by the Spirit. That He is the source of our life and power. And so the first thing that I think that we have to say, I think this is so important as we start out here, talking about the Holy Spirit and the church and so, is to say that the Holy Spirit is God. You know, a big part of what God's doing in the Bible is revealing His character to us. Showing us who He is. And as God reveals His character to us, what He shows us is that He is actually Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You could take, for example, Jesus' instruction to us at our baptism. That when we are baptized, that we would be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is involved in welcoming us into God's family. Right? Right? And so, God shows us that He is Father. He is Son. He is Holy Spirit. The way that I think of it is that God is an eternal divine friendship. That God really is truly three persons. And yet, God is also truly one. God is one and three. And so, we have this word, this word that we use to talk about the nature of God in this way, and that word is Trinity or triunity, right? Right? God is one God in three persons. And so when we see the baptism of Jesus, His own baptism, think about this. The Holy Spirit visibly, so that especially John the Baptist can see, the Holy Spirit visibly falls on Jesus. And there is a voice from heaven, that is the voice of our Heavenly Father, speaking over Jesus, this is my beloved Son. And so we see in, in the act of salvation that the, the entirety, the fullness of God is involved in reconciling us to Himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why do I say this? Because I think it's so important for us to honor the Holy Spirit as God. That when we experience the manifest presence of God, when we are blessed to know the joy, the delight of being in the presence of God, that we would know that that is actually God who we are experiencing. It is not an emanation from God with apologies to Star Wars. It is not some force that's going to be with us, right? Some kind of impersonal force. That it is actually God Himself who is with us. When we are given assurance of our faith, when the Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are God's children in Jesus, that we've been adopted, that we belong to Him. When the Spirit gives that assurance, that is God Himself touching us with that deposit, guaranteeing the fullness of our salvation. When God enables us, He calls us and He enables us to do things that are far beyond what we could do. I mean, even spontaneously speaking other languages, how cool would that be, right? Even something like that, that when God enables us, when He calls us and enables us to do something that is beyond our ability, that that is God. It is God. Not an emanation from God, but God Himself. And that really, that really brings us to our second point here. And that is that as we look into our Scripture, we see that the believers have to wait. They have to wait on the Holy Spirit. And part of what that's about is the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a magical force that we can just command. That we could get some kind of hocus pocus magic stuff going and we could say the right formulas and we could you know, do this and do that and then we could manipulate the Holy Spirit and tell the Holy Spirit when to show up and how to show up. We cannot do that because the Holy Spirit is God. We must simply wait on the Holy Spirit and follow the Holy Spirit because He is 
sovereign. He is God. But not only do they have to wait on the Holy Spirit because He is God. God's going to make that so clear in this. That the church belongs to God. But not only that, if this church thing is actually going to work, it will be dependent on the Holy Spirit. The church's ministry, quite simply, cannot happen without the Holy Spirit. We simply cannot be the church having the love of Jesus between us without the Holy Spirit. This is not, friends, a human organization. This is God's church. Jesus says in Luke 24, 49, And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Do you know, I, I think it's actually kind of interesting that um, the, the apostles are actually the most, <laughs> the best trained, best trained church leaders of all time. So uh, think about this now. Like, we have training for church leaders now, right? Like, we, we do. Uh, I had to be trained, other leaders are trained, so on. <laughs> but these guys were trained by Jesus Himself. Think about that. They spent three years, day in, day out with Jesus. They saw Jesus do everything. How He related to people. They saw Him working miracles. They were with Him day after day as He was teaching. <laughs> they even got 40 days with Him after His resurrection, which was sort of this intensive learning period where Jesus is instructing them in the Scriptures that we know as the Old Testament. He's showing them how He is the fulfillment of the Scriptures. The apostles are the best trained church leaders that there ever have been. Right? You, you understand the point? Okay, so now carry that on and consider the fact that even though they had been trained by Jesus, even though He had sent them out on these practice missions as a part of their training, even though, even though they had experienced the risen Christ, even though they knew the good news of Jesus so well, of how God is reconciling the world to Himself and Jesus, even though all of that, Jesus says you got to wait. Think about that. Why didn't when Jesus ascended into heaven, they just take off? Okay, guys, let's hit the trail. Let's take the Gospel to the world. They didn't do that. Why? Because Jesus wants them to understand, and it is the reality that they will not be able to be the church without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, it amazes me and it saddens me when churches and when the church in general fails to see, disregards, forgets this absolute truth about the dependence of the church on the Holy Spirit for the ministry of Jesus. Listen, I haven't been doing this forever. I started in youth ministry, um, right? As a lot of us do. I started in youth ministry. Watch out, Kristen. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, started out in youth ministry um, over 20 years ago. And so it's been at least enough time for me to see a number of churches and to see the church at large fall into what I would call the idolatry of human effort. The idolatry of human effort. And the idea is that there is this phase or there is this fad or there is this methodology or there is this program that will lead to the success of the church. I've even seen churches idolize facilities, right? Buildings. People have actually said to me, well, you know, Jeremy, if you build it, they will come. And I'm like, you know that's not in the Bible, right? Like, that is from a movie. That is not God's holy word. I don't know why you're just declaring it like it's from the Bible, because it is not. And so what we see, and this is really sad, we see churches, church after church, going into crippling levels of debt, because they believe if they can have this amazing facility, then people will come to Jesus. They will have success for the ministry of Jesus. All sorts of if-thens. If we have the right kind of facility, if we have the right kind of music, if we, if we have beliefs that don't offend our culture, if we have this, if we have that, if we have a young pastor, if we have an experienced pastor. You know, the old joke is that every church wants a 30-year-old pastor with 40 years of experience. Right? That's... 
I think actually there's some truth to that. If we have this, then, and we, we forget the most important if then, and that is that if we will yield to the Holy Spirit, if we will wait upon the Holy Spirit, then there will be life and peace and joy and yes, fruit in the church of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I'm thinking about this morning the Methodist church in Cuba and the Methodist church in Africa where there is right now a work of revival that is just surging in those places. And, and I think about the fact that in those churches, and this has already happened for some today, and for some it's happening right now, that in those churches, that there are people, they are packed from the back to the front, from side to side, they are packed with people, and they don't, listen, I know this is shocking, they don't have air conditioning. <laughs> they don't have strobe lights and smoke machines. A lot of them are on dirt floors, and some of them are even in the open air. But people are being drawn in waves and waves to Jesus. And the question I think we have to ask then is why? You know, listen, the followers of Jesus there are working hard. They are giving themselves to the work of the Lord. That is certainly true. But the power is not theirs that is accomplishing this work of revival. It's not theirs. And they would tell you that. That it is the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the church that is accomplishing the work of Jesus. Friends, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is life and there is freedom and there is joy and, and there is power. You know, um, there are people there who will walk miles and miles and miles in the hot sun and the driving rain so that they can get to church. Why? David says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Do you know, to stand in the manifest presence of God is the sweetest thing that I've ever experienced. And so they will walk and they will risk rejection and they will risk persecution to be in the presence of the Lord. And so the question then is, how can this be today? How can this be today? The people who were amazed at Pentecost, they said, how can this be? And this is a question I think that's on many of our hearts. How can this actually be Today. And I think that that question to God, God, how can this be? It, it actually causes God to reflect a question back at us. And that question for us individually, right? Individually, but us corporately, that question is simply this. Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Is that what, is that what you really want? Church, do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Believers were together that day and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Without exception, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was in fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. He said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that there's this day coming when God will pour out, and don't miss that verb, pour out, lavish over His people the Holy Spirit. And on that day, He says that He will give dreams and visions to both the young and the old, to both men and women, those of Great high account and those of no account. Nobody in this list is excluded from the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to just take a moment, an aside here, to talk about age. <laughs> because sometimes I hear people when they talk about our church, talking about our church apologetically because there are lots of old people in our church. And I just want to say, God is no respecter of persons. God, when He looks at us, considers age to be irrelevant. God doesn't say that young believers are really so much more valuable than old believers. And, and the, the opposite is true. God doesn't look at old believers and say, oh, they're so much more valuable. What the Scripture says is that, that what God looks at is faithfulness. What God looks at is a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, young and old alike. So let's stop apologizing for the fact that we are winning at this game of age. Right? If it's a, well, okay, not if it's golf, but let's say it's like, it's like another game, like some football or basketball or something. We're winning that game, right? We're winning that game. And so. <laughs> And so we have these dreams and visions given, being given to people. For somebody, it's, um, 
is, is to love on the kids at our elementary school. That's, that's a dream. That's a vision from God. For another person, it, it's to invite a, a neighbor that, that's gotten connected, uh, to invite them to come and hear the gospel. For another, it's to resource the ministry of the church. God gives these dreams and visions to young and old alike, dreams and visions of how we would be used to reconcile the world to God in Jesus Christ. But back to the question, this collective question, do we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because the thing is that you can't be filled with one thing and filled with another. And what I mean by that is that we can't be filled with the Holy Spirit and also filled with ourselves, right? It, it actually it kind of doesn't work that way. If we want to be full of ourselves, then we have to sort of nudge the Holy Spirit out of the way. And so the question really is, it's a real question. Do we actually want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Jesus says in John 17, 33, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life go, you will save it. This is the way to life, to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I yield to you. I surrender to you entirely. I am not partially yours. I am completely yours. And what Jesus promises is that in this new life where we surrender our lives to Christ, that inside of us there will be a spring of living water welling up. And He says, He tells us in His Word that that is the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit will come and reside in us and will well up to eternal life. will just pour out. He will pour out His Spirit on us and in us. And, and so... If the answer then is yes, yes, Lord, this is, my life is yours. I'm no longer my own. Lord, it's no longer I who live, but, but Christ who lives in me. If we say that individually and corporately, then, then friends, let us, let us endeavor to pray. To pray for a fresh anointing of the Spirit. Let us endeavor to pray for a new Pentecost for our church. Let's pray that God would give us that same love for each other, that He would bind us together, that God would give us this, this power from on high to be a part of how He's reconciling the world to Himself. You know, I, I talked last week about how this revivalistic spirit is actually a part of our Methodist DNA. There's this Methodist pastor, David Thomas, who he, he wrote about our founder, John Wesley, and, and I thought this was so awesome. I wanted to share it with you. John Wesley had been amazed at the praying he observed among the Moravians in a place called Hernhut. So that in the first watch night after his conversion, New Year's Eve, 1738, so give you a kind of an idea of what sort of New Year's Eve parties Methodists have, right? New Year's Eve, 1738, he was gathered with Whitfield, that's George Whitfield, and Charles, his brother, and about 60 others at Fetter Lane. And he writes in his journal, about three in the morning as we were continuing pressing in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us insomuch that many cried out and many fell to the ground. As soon as we were recovered a little from that awe and amazement at the presence of His majesty, we broke out with one voice. We praise Thee, O God. We acknowledge Thee to be the Lord. And so may our prayers and praises arise to God as a church family that the power of God would be known in our midst, that He would use us so powerfully to reach those who are far from God through the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. May it be so here in our day as it was in the days that we read about in the book of Acts. And maybe I could get an amen. amen. And if you would, let's, friends, let's please pray together. Lord, we do thank You for Your church. And specifically right now, we want to give You thanks and praise for the gift of the Holy Spirit. That Lord, You would come and You would choose to dwell in our hearts by faith. That You would choose to, to bring us together as, as church families, as, as the body of Christ. That You would choose us to bind us one to another. And that You would choose to use us to reconcile the world to Yourself through Jesus. God, we are truly amazed and we are truly grateful. And we pray, Lord, that Your Spirit would fall on our church, a fresh anointing, a, a, a new Pentecost, Lord, that you would, you would sow such love between us, that You would sow such devotion to You, Lord, in us, and that You would, Lord, use us in Your mighty power to reach this community in Jesus' name. And may the glory all be His. And together we say, Amen. Amen.